I guess I have, I have something of a synthetic question, I guess. Um, and this may not be the most popular point to raise, uh, but I was thinking about Professor Bex and Professor Dale Hayes' um, presentations in conjunction with each other. And the question that I, that I asked myself right off of that is, are we really that special? Mm -hmm. um, and given how Professor Beck outlined the notion that what we do in humanity is typically considered a social science or part of the scientific inquiry, a very different professional school, and essentially everywhere but the Anglophone level. And then mentioning what Professor Dale Hayes said, I am. Um, and your, your analogy of why would you bother studying this before going to work to sell office partitions is brilliant. Um, but I don't think it just happens to us. Uh, a very dear friend of mine, a brilliant man, did a master's in theoretical physics and is now a brewer at Molson Pink. Uh, and the question that was always asked of him was, why did you bother doing this master's in theoretical physics? So I wonder, perhaps in this sense, I mean, based on Professor Beck's dinner chat example, we can't explain what we do to the general public, neither can they. I wonder if what we're really seeing here is not so much the crisis of the humanities, but the crisis of the humanities in conjunction with what we would call kind of broadly the natural sciences or science for science's sake, uh, the traditional core of the university curriculum, juxtaposed against the more professional schools, engineering, medicine. Yeah. Disciplines that are seen as not, you know, can not be evaluated by the term of relevance. And we're, talking, exactly. we're talking about this in the last meeting about the pure mathematics. Exactly. Uh, is under exactly the same kind of um, mm -hmm. attack as, as humanities are. That was interesting also in really, relation to Rafika when you're talking about um, uh, um, uh, Michael Piper trying to not use the term humanities to think about you know, something um, not, that not as specific to the humanities but defines what we are doing that is under question at the moment. And I think it does come back to the question of relevance. Right, so yeah, I mean, my, my big point with this is I wonder to what extent we're, we're yeah. viewing ourselves more victimized, more isolated than we perhaps really are. Uh, and I wonder perhaps you know, what we're really facing here is the crisis of the university system yeah. and its, its intended inputs and outputs, and whether us, along with science, raise this idea of intrinsic knowledge, for knowledge is safe, or whether we really are in a really different realm of what. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, and, and following up on this in, in, in the same vein of inquiry, and, uh, uh, the question when I listen to your presentation again, and this is something that, that I'm thinking about this for, for a long time now, the question is, in our extremely complicated, extremely complex society, with extremely diverse interests and stakeholders, it's all fine. In that very complex environment, who holds the interpretative high ground to determine what is useful and what is not useful? Useful according to what, and in what matrix, in what public or social arena, according to what parameters. And we seem to be a little bit too eager to put ourselves in a position that, oh yeah, we're not really that useful, but we'd like to explain why we are at the end of the day anyways. Whereas the problem of <coughs> usefulness and how we frame this question is something that applies to almost all other intellectual disciplines. Who puts your sister-in-law, who puts your sister-in-law in a position where she is entitled to ask how useful something is that you do? That is built on a variety of societal assumptions. Otherwise, she wouldn't ask that question. And they are not obvious. And I think we should we should look at those assumptions. I think one of, one of the ironies that has struck me in the last few years is to, to follow up. I think specifically with what you were addressing is that if you remember, I can't remember how long ago was it ten years ago, in which um, technological colleges were turned into universities um, in England, um, and that happened also in, in Canada and in certain places as well. Uh, so tech, you know, uh, places that were basically training oriented wanted to become universities. But at the same time, since then, there's been a, a bit pressure for the inverse metamorphosis to take place, and universities to become more like trade schools. Um, of the, and that's where I think that that version of usefulness has been sneaking in um, and taking over. And I don't know, you know why or how that's happened, um, but it's been a, a strange switch I want to say one thing in response to this point, that, which I take. I mean, I, of course, it's true that people want to do pure mathematics that was um, a challenge in similar ways to the challenge. I do think, though, that there's some, and I think this was part of Clint's point in wanting to call what we do human sciences, that science enjoys some kind of respect 
Um, perhaps because many people think, well, if they think about this, that you have to have some of the basic science that in order to get to the knowledge of how to prove the air. But if we knew nothing about military maneuvers in the Roman Republic or Shakespeare, we'd still be able to prove the air. So um, I think there is some kind of difference between how humanities are viewed and how even theoretical sciences are viewed. Um, other thing I suspect plays into this is just the gendered nature of disciplines. So science, insofar as it's still viewed as this kind of masculine enterprise, uh, still counts as better than things you can do with language, which girls have been able to do. So I, I think there's a bunch of things going on there, but I don't, I don't want to dispute your general point. Of view. I just want to weigh in. I'm, I'm doubtful about some of the information I'm pulling up. Um, there was a university committee that I was on um, four or five years ago, and it was um, it was the associate deans from all the different faculties um, working with the BP research. So basically, fighting for the money to keep them all high ground in terms of finance at the university as a lot of the BP research. And it was very clear that there was some unusual alliances forming around the table. I was representing ours. Music was moving into interesting research through digital humanities and other other kinds of research, and um, the very quiet, effective voice in the room was actually the associate dean of science, who was Bruce Lennox at the time. If you know him, he's very effective. But he's very soft-spoken, and all he would say was like a little refrain that used to come back. You know, that as the big research was saying, we have to go out there and get industry dollars. And to work on leveraging new and interesting ways for the university to chart new directions. He just said, but we can't forget the value of basic knowledge. We can't forget the value of basic knowledge. And I remember nodding and thinking, that's right. That's, that's part of what we're doing as well. We want that jazz based look, that we can't forget the traditions that we're coming out of. And we can, we can move forward, but only if we remember them. So I realized that line. And it was it was with those the basic scientists, so it's, it's you know, now, it's been a century. And the very scientists that are now in trouble because of the lack of funding for traditional science and the push towards industry partnership that's really um, jeopardizing the strength and continuity of the traditional sciences um, at a time when we in the humanities are actually um, have a great freedom to move across humanities disciplines, to think about ourselves as human scientists, to think about different kinds of configurations and whether we might be perceived to be um, a proactive force as we think through the changes in, in the discipline. I mean, who's going to be called on to think through you know, what the university should and will look like you know, in the face of moves or in the face of the kinds of challenges? And actually, it's like, you know, we're in a position of thinking through that. So to Anne's point, I think, you know, rather than being in a defensive position, yes. we really have a wonderful chance of knowledge to take the time. Mm -hmm. well, I think that was a, a, a very good way to start us all thinking about and coming into what some of these you were saying too, Kevin, about some sort of dangers of defensiveness. So we, we, there is a, because of arguments between allies, we've taken off in a position of defensiveness and we have to rethink that. Um, so I'll step up to you. Um, so one strategy that sometimes is explored for reconciling the, the uh, usefulness and value, yes. and maybe usefulness and relevance are interesting dimensions of the same thing to explore, is, is uh, to seek ways of engaging in contemporary discourses and debates and issues. Um, so uh, just, just, you know, I don't mean to frame that. Um, what I would like to ask um, the people who spoke or, or uh, the group in general is to what extent do we think that it's uh, useful, not normatively, but just in our own sort of practices as learners, as teachers, whatever, to um, make more explicit jumps from sort of, um, you know, what we tend to be good at as humans in looking at the past um, to the contemporary and the future um, context. Yeah, I know. 
thinking about that in relation to some of the climate change. So, right. And obviously, I mean, we've already been making this where there's eco criticism much longer than the climate, climate change debate. Uh, but I think what some of the environmental humanities let us think about more is um, how these cultural figurations travel across disciplinary boundaries in a lot of ways. And how cultural figurations um, are also related with um, you know, ideological um, battles that are ongoing. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's crucial. I mean, it's hard to think about how, I mean, without going into, we're taking on instrumental mindset, you know, that mindset of the grant. <laughs> we can think about it in, that, in those terms, right? What is going to what is going to be the hook that is a, a contemporary grounding for the for the question I want to ask? But in a way, how that how that hook can be um, linked into the practice that you want to actually perform as a scholar who's engaged in these questions, if that's clear to some extent. No, I mean that that's it's a, it's a relation between the practice and how you can actually intervene into that cultural figuration and how it circulates in society. And I think that's something that's as humanists very well. Hans, when you began talking about classics now versus classics in the 80s, I think that's a classic, sorry, example of the, the differences. The, the problem why classics in the 80s was a dead end because it was classical in the old sense. It was about what happened in the past, you know, timeless, sealed off in, a, in another world. And where classics has changed and become such a success story is precisely not just in sort of response to issues that then classics, you know, able to see, you know, sort of have relevance for the material they're teaching. But in also, and I think this is part of your point, to directing those issues, um, you know, sort of that, that questions of you know, inclusivity, gender, all of these, of these issues are embedded in classical thinking um, and that help us think about those issues today. So, yeah, because I think we're all also a little bit um, wary of this sort of pure presentism of just you know, reading the past only for you know, what it tells us about right now and sort of creating narcissistic um, reflections of our own image. Um, there are ways in which we can look to the past um, to see how they're dealing with similar situations, but you know, learn from that. Um, it's important. But I think that's that's one of the things that has changed classes, and I would say too, um, you know, sort of literary studies generally. Um, yeah. On Stefan's point, uh, for us in the history of classics, speaking for a discipline and stuff, this is always the history channel problem. Yeah. And it's the first thing I'm thinking of when you ask your question. So how do we deal with the History Channel problem? Yeah. On the one hand, it's great to have the History Channel. It's great to have a popular interest out there and cater to those needs and answer those questions and be visible. On the other hand, it's the History Channel. Or whatever we like related brands and shadow. You know. I personally like to talk to them or serve as a movie advisor, or do this or that, or because I think it's important. But of course, this is not what we do in our university environments, in our daily research and teaching operations. So I often find myself in this, yeah. again, Janus head situation where I'm looking to the one side and looking back, backwards and forwards. What am I doing? Is this popular consulting and popular interest and working on a discourse and, and influencing a, a discourse that is so much bigger than the ivory tower discourse? Or is this real research which is tucked away in a, in a different room, in a different environment almost? It's, we try to build connections between the two. But that, at least for me, that doesn't always work. And, uh, I'm interested in Stefan's question and in Hans's response because it seems to me there's actually two issues here. One is the how do you speak about what you do to a more public audience I mean, to make it? And that's actually somewhat different, I think, from Stefan's question about is the way to motivate an interest in the past to say look at how it um, could be used to make sense of something in the present. And um, it seems to me that's that's not that hard to do, and it's pretty easy to say, okay, let's read ourselves politics, and one thing you might be interested in ourselves politics is what he has to say about democracy, and notice that he doesn't make the same assumptions about democracy that you might already. So that's a way to say, read ourselves politics so you can understand something about democracy as you know it. Um, 
but I'm really resistant to the idea that the only thing that might be of interest about the past in some way which it connects to how we live now. And that's partly because it seems to me what's actually really interesting about the past is its strangeness. And the more you know about it, the more it seems actually not like us. Um, and, and so, so thinking about that, thinking about how things were, in fact, genuinely really different, seems to me salubrious. And I don't know that I could say more to defend it than that, that um, not resting gently always on our assumptions is a good thing for us. Um, sort of like turning down the thermostat. It's a little cold all the time. That's a really, really important point. This is going to go in a different direction, so if you don't mind, I'll, I'll maybe see a moment to uh, talk about something a little bit different. But um, at the last session, Sue Morton raised the point that the humanities had an efflorescence in the Cold War as a kind of response to um, Soviet politics and so on, that there was a, a focus on the humanities as a way of resisting uh, certain Cold War interventions and to draw those lines. But today, I thought it was very interesting that there were that Margaret, Margaret, you referred to your uh, sister-in-law as a virtuous person um, who wondered about the difference between saving bodies, saving souls, or reducing inequality. And Hans, you talked about social um, uh, inequities and how the humanities might actually help us think about reducing social inequities. I've just been reading about the framing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, and, and they reached an impasse in the discussions about the uh, framing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, over uh, issues about the relation of the social to the, the individual, and specifically as a kind of human case. And the way they got themselves out of this impasse was by talking about, at length, Robinson Crusoe. Um, Alan Watt, the Australian who was uh, sort of helping to um, think about the phrasing of the Declaration of Human Rights, um, raised this as a case uh, in which they started to discuss, is it possible to have individual development without social relations? Um, and the Soviets said, no, this is an impossibility, and uh, therefore we can't, we must discard that right away, and, and so on. And so they started to rethink, use it then, and somebody made a literary critical point that Robinson Crusoe was really about somebody who salvages things that are from a, a shipwreck and has money and instruments and so on, and therefore does have a kind of social relation to the world already, notwithstanding the fact that he's living alone on an island with a bunch of goats and, and so on. So there's this, I think there's this very, I thought there was a very interesting emergence of the discussion in Kevin's uh, paper as well, talking about sort of a citizenship that grows out of social uh, social media and, and crowdsourcing and so on. And I just wondered if there was, if we could say more about alleviating social inequality or something as, it's not about the emergence of an individual so much or the, the prerequis prerequisites for individual growth that, that Kevin referred to, but actually also social growth that comes out of the study of the humanities and somehow those things work, working in tandem with each other. I guess my short question would be though for um, Marguerite, and that is, what makes your sister-in-law a virtuous person? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's the Aristotelian. Uh, she's, um, she does good works. She, uh, when my aged mother is in the hospital, she'll be there at three in the morning sitting by her bedside. My point was that she was not just someone um, preaching these that she, I want to be fair, that she actually is, I think, herself a useful person. <clears throat> and so to reply to Hans's worry about like, who's she, <clears throat> to be, I think that there are, um, or again, the objection that worries me is the objection not coming from the anchors who think what they do is useful and what people in the humanities do isn't, but from people who are you know, slogging in the salt pond and wondering about what we do as this pastime for um, the gentlemen and landowners, that sort of worry. So I, I, obviously, I think she's mistaken. I shouldn't have all the virtues. Um, uh, and I, I, 
I take your point absolutely about what we're trying to do here is not just make individual lives somehow richer, but also build a richer political community. That seems to me And that's a kind of response to the like I should just note that I don't think engineering students think about that when they're choosing their career paths, you know, how, how what I'm going to do is going to benefit society. I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting in that the perception, and this goes back to what we were saying last time, Sean, about the sort of envy here. The perception is that those who study the um, humanities, there's this kind of self selfishness about it, or you know, um, that we have a, a privilege that others don't have. But Darren, you want to I want to raise something in response to the Raf's uh, provocation on rethinking the humanities in terms of practice. First of all, just as you can tell, Raf is a total pain in the ass <laughs> that I have to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fantastic. Uh, I think there is the, the, one of the symptoms or one of the aspects of, of, of what we're all trying to grapple with is a kind of unresolved relationship to our own practice. Uh, and it's um, and the demands of its diversity and the way in which the environment that we, we try to work in as a coherent as coherent practitioners of the humanities in fact is enforcing a kind of multiplicity of cross cutting demands on us that aren't always easily reconcilable. We like to, to uh, you know and, and increasingly often for instrumental reasons themselves we, we like to always say well teaching. This now research is mutually co constituted and they go together and they're inextricable, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, so we think about trying to respond to, to, to some of the, uh, the uh, you know, the, the, the kinds of um, opportunities that, that Stefan was talking about. I think we begin to see that we actually have a huge complex set of, of practical expectations. And and that the demands of our scholarship, the, the practical demands of our scholarship, are not identical to and always coherent with the demands of our teaching, which are themselves divided between our the practical demands of undergraduate education and graduate education. And then when we place the possibility of a public face and a public intervention uh, into our role as uh, humanities practitioners, that again brings a whole other set of skills, demands, and that's multiple as well because, you know, maybe you're good at, you're good at acting as a consultant on a film, but maybe you're actually expected to write an op-ed for a newspaper. Or maybe, you know. So there is actually, I think, this kind of incredible fragmentation of our practice that is underway uh, that we're not very well reconciled with. Um, and that even though there are ways in which it's important for us to understand how we are one practitioner of scholarship that unites the kind of uh, knowledge practices of, of research, writing, and teaching. I'm not sure that that actually comes close to the ways in which one symptom of what we're experiencing is a kind of untenable fragmentation of our practice that we have not figured out how to actually uh, render coherent. Yeah, I think the, the common thread that seems to be running through much of this is the question of professionalism. Um, and I very much appreciate your, your comment, Mr. Delia, about how you have your professional research interests and your amateur research interests, which is a, a distinction that I don't think we make often enough. And I think that the, the general consensus of this humanities crisis now is that we are somehow not a professional. Uh, that we do this either selfishly or we do this because we value this intrinsic good, but I think that we're overlooking the fact that we are a profession much like any other. There's a set of professional skills, albeit fragmented, and we're trying to figure out exactly what those are in relation to the university and the public. But at the end of the day, it is, in essence, a job like any other. Uh, and I think that one of the things that perhaps we ought to bear in mind a little bit more is that we are, we are productive members of society, in some sense. If our professional obligation is teaching, if our professional obligation is research, if our professional obligation is civic formation, whatever it is, we are doing something. Uh, and in this sense, I think perhaps it would be best borne in mind that we are not completely separated from the professional world against which we like to contrast ourselves so much, but rather we're part of that very different way. Uh, and perhaps what we, we should be doing a little bit more is thinking exactly what are our professional obligations on, on any of those things. I think Darren's comment also ties on your earlier point that the crisis in the humanities has to do with changing expectations about what the role of the university in general is. 
and the relationship between the university and the outside world, which used to be a much more indirect one, you know, that we were, you know, training thinkers who would go out and somehow that knowledge would you know, sort of trickle down society. But now there's a greater expectation of a one-to-one -one correspondence, that we are training people with things that are, and, and we're going to see the impact, especially with, you know, there's another you know, word these days, of course, the impact of education. Um, on people immediately outside, or the way in which we deal with um, the outside is through um, uh, you know, public speaking. Um, that there used to be a whole tradition of that as well. You know, there used to be much more I think, uh, of open public lectures at McGill. Um, but now there's a pressure on us to do that further. And that's, that's the boundaries have kind of changed and are changing. Yeah, I mean, I think it bears on the question that Hans raised in relation to Marguerite's uh, sister in law. What is it that positions her in a, in a position to be able to uh, judge what is useful or useless in what context and to what ends? I think, what I, I guess what I'm suggesting here talking about the fragmentation of our practice is that I think that, that, that in fact people like their sister-in-law, when they make a judgment about the usefulness of a uselessness of something like philosophy, actually could be saying any number of things in terms of what part of it, what part of this practice that you are engaged in is, is being held up against what kind of standard of usefulness or, or uselessness, you know. And the question is like, in my practice, which, which of those criteria am I actually uh, uh, orienting myself towards in any given moment of my practice? You know, being Raph's supervisor is my primary obligation to his inquiry, is my primary obligation to my discipline to make sure that he's trained according to its standards, is my primary obligation to society to, to, to spend the money that's being spent on producing him, and all these, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's, and, and, and all of those expectations cut in multiple ways. Humanities is actually starting to question the centrality of the human and the humanities. I've been turning to the digital and looking at other forms of life. Whereas, Kevin, you were kind of emphasizing that the, and I'm not sure this is your own view so much as what you took to these standard defenses of the humanities, this shared tradition of great works and liberal values of the art. So it seems there's a real tension in those two pictures of the humanities. Um, and, and it raises this question whether what we ought to be doing is defending, you know, Aristotle and Shakespeare and the value of those for everyone who's a human being versus um, something which I don't actually think has to exclude Aristotle and Shakespeare at all, but it's just the way of saying there's a whole lot else we might be interested in, a whole lot of different questions that I'd be asking about Aristotle and Shakespeare. Um, so what you, so one of my questions is just, did you actually want to defend this notion of, or do any of us think that there is this thing, you know, a set of great books that we could um, decide on, and a set of shared liberal values that we want to impart to uh, future generations? Or is that something that nobody here actually wants to defend anymore? And if so, how do we see the, the shifting boundaries of what we're doing? I'm also interested in this question of practices versus disciplines, but maybe that's yeah, it, it's interesting to you. Uh, another thing that I looked at was um, descriptions of departments on uh, websites. So there's always the mandatory line that would say, like, why study English, why study philosophy, why study art history. And the thing that strikes you when you read it is that they don't talk about the disciplines often. You, know, you see things like um, our graduates go on to great success in law and business administration. Oh, and then you're like, well, I, I thought I was going to go study English. <laughs> So it's really interesting to see people um, writing on these manifestic defenses of their discipline by drawing or by highlighting the fact that you can use it in another context, which is really strange to me. Um, and the Stanford page has a, has a, a chart where they break down uh, the percentage of the people who complete doctorates there. And uh, there was 17% continuing academic life, and then they highlight the fact that they, they turn out a lot of lawyers with great thinking skills from the departments, but the, the, the 
discussion is just odd that you're displacing your defensive yeah. the degree onto another field. From a Aristotelian perspective, you're only able to talk about the, what it leads to, not the, 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 the 